for this year's winter tour, which they're doing this year for the first time in two years since COVID hit. And I'll be doing the same work that I normally do, which is to say the program art. It's like a four page fold out for the cover and a four page fold out painting for the inside of the program. Jean is already starting to work on the design for the program, which she designs the entire thing, choosing all the photos and these, the setups and everything. And so that's, that's in progress right now. I just started that. And uh, God, what else, did, what else did I work on, Jean? Do you remember? I worked on several other things. I can't, they kind of like go in and out of my head as I do them, you know? But this one's really involving because, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's taking into consideration the, the tour and the art that I've already done for 18 years. And the, like, not desiring to repeat myself. And, of course, Jean kicks my butt because I have a tendency to repeat myself with this. And she, you know, she starts to point out, well, that's just, kind of, we did that already. You did that already. How about this? How about that? So, and, you know, so there's that kind of like effort going on right now. And I'm drawing and it's not entirely there yet. Probably in about two more days, I'll have some initial, you know, uh, final first sketch of both paintings. So that's around. Okay, cool. All right. And obviously we can't see that stuff just no, yet. No, not yet. And we're not going to hold it up. Not going to show anything yet. Right. That's That all remains under wraps until uh, the release of the first concert, right? I think is when they released uh, Yeah, in October. Yeah, I think we, <clears throat> we... When do we release the program, G? Yeah, when do people see it? Sec second week in October, we start to ship it because Jean handles all the printing and binding and, and you know, here with her printer. And, Very cool. And too, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff happening that we can't talk about yet. Some really great, <laughs> exciting projects going on that once nice. they become... Nice. So, yeah, we get some people tuning in. Elijah's saying hello. Hello, Elijah. Greetings, Elijah. Uh, so... You know, with you talking about that, uh, the the concert program that actually brings us into uh, what we were going to talk about today. Yes. I didn't realize you were going to mention painting and working on the program, but that's actually a very good segue. Yeah. And we're talking about uh, painted art for reproduction. Now, a lot of art, uh, I would say, today in in today's climate is is consumed through Instagram, you know, or on telephone. Uh, telephones and iPads and yep. things like that. Um, or at least that, you know, people are aware of that's how they're consuming it. But art still exists out in the world. And you're looking at it through packaging design, you know, concert programs, tour programs, things like that, that still actually have to get printed and made. Yes. So that's what, that's what, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about actually handling paintings and what your process is and how you think about things, uh, knowing that they're going to be for print. That the first one of the first so, things you're thinking about is size that is going to be reproduced. You know, whether you know, like okay, a magic. Why, why do you take size into consideration? Well, yeah, if you have a magic, the gathering painting that's going to be reduced down to a card size, which is what inch and a half, two inches wide. What about that, yep. Two by three inches. Well, the entire card, but the the images, and as opposed to a painting that would be on a poster, say, or even this program that I'm designing, which the program is is about that big, you know. So yeah. it, it's about taking that into consideration. If you're going to do, it, at least that that's the way I think. I mean, you're designing it for magic or any card set, Harry Potter or whatever you're doing. X-Men, you know, uh, Marvel. It has to read that size. Okay. It has to have an impact at that size, which means you can't really get too complex with it, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not saying that some people can't pull that off. I'm sure they can. 
But I, I have a tendency to think in terms of, well, you got to keep it read, readable and have the primary center of interest read right away and not be too confusing, you know, for your eyes to register what's going on there. So I think that's one thing. You know, just complexity of the image, probably. Okay. The way to put so it. Let's, okay, let's break that down a little bit more for for everybody. I want just to get into some of the technical nitty gritty. All right, so you have a, a concert program, which for the, those who haven't seen the Trans Siberian Orchestra uh, concert programs, let me on, grab it. Let me grab the last one I did just quickly here. Should have so had anyway, these me. things are larger than uh, regular magazine size. You know, you're going with uh, slightly larger dimensions. There you go. That's last, this is uh, 2019. Right, and then it's like. The, the outside is a fold out. You fold out four. This this I did vertically. Whoops, upside down. Vertically. This is a vertical. I mean, several ideas merged into one, more or less ongoing image. Which is a whole. This was a whole different method of you know, combining a horizontal storyline, which the inside is illustrations defining principal central story song in the Christmas Eve and other stories concert. That's what, but it's, uh, now if I was to do this for a card, you certainly contain, could not contain all this information in a you know picture that big. Yeah. So it, it, it's about simplification. In other words, all right, there you go. So we have that that size, which is essentially a poster, and then versus, uh, you know, Magic the Gathering, which if anybody saw the icon to the announcement for this show, that was actually a magic painting that I put next to your picture. Um, is Do you handle the application of the paint differently? No, no, I don't think so. It's, I, I'm not, no. I mean, you may not necessarily need to get as cleaned up edges and, you know, tight as you do for, a, you know, if you need to, if, if there's a deadline involved and you got to get it done fast, because a lot of that won't read, you know, reduce down so small rough edges or, you know, but generally speaking, I don't, I don't think any differently, I mean, except I'll be using smaller brushes. Obviously, the bigger the painting the broader, the broader the brush you use, and the smaller the painting, the smaller the brush you use. Your now, physical I, movements will be different too, you know, bigger and smaller, you know? Okay. Yeah, I know, I know with black and white, like ink work, they talk about, you know, making sure that your feathering doesn't get too close. Right, that's... Because when, that's, when it reduces down, it's gonna go to mud. Totally you know, understandable. Or, or solid black. Does, well, uh, there was an artist I knew, and not to mention names, who I would try to counsel with, you're painting too goddamn tight. This is for reproduction. This is this was to be a single, a comic book, painted comic book. Some of the panels are this big. The trees, he was painting the trees in the distance in the panels with every single leaf. He said, <laughs> the leaves are smaller than the dot pattern. That will, you, the dot <laughs> pattern being the printing process. So you're just wasting all your time and it's just it's going to turn into mush there's no clarity to it you know so if you get too tight if you get hyper tight with something that's going to be reduced it's kind of pointless just all gets lost it gets lost so you've wasted a lot of time <laughs> so it's like yeah there's whole kinds of things that the case take into consideration ahead of time I think though color pretty much remains the same for me it doesn't matter what size it is you know mm -hmm. it, it, it just the, the palette the chroma intensity yeah. or lack of intensity that just depends on the subject itself how you want to handle it in terms of the color you know yeah okay now so color you know that that brings up a couple different things as well uh one you know we're talking about the printing process and and right now 
uh, the printing process is still done in what they refer to as CMYK, which is cyan, yellow, magenta, and K. Right. That represents black. Keep talking. I'll be right back. For, for the people that don't know. So it's CMYK. Now, with, with computers and a lot of technology and what you view online, that's the RGB color gamut, which is red, blue, green, and combinations of those things, plus uh, black and white. And so Greg went to go get something. And cards. This is a card, card set. Right. Now, all of this stuff was done not for cards. This was a card set that we did many, many years ago. Comic Images did 1992. And a lot of these were, were our reprints of the pictures out of the books that I was illustrating for Unicorn Publishing back in the day. So they still register, you know? Yep. Obviously, the, the the larger image registers better. Like that's out of Alice in Wonderland. And that was a, you know, big close-up in the book. But it, it's still... I mean, with that going, I'm watching, I'm doing this live stream from my phone. So I... I have you approximately one quarter of my screen size, and then that card was even. I yeah, like a little tiny. One thirty second of that, but that Alice in Wonderland still just registered. Yeah. Read immediately. Yeah, a bigger image registers. It's quite simply, complexity does not. It it gets, you know, lost. So. And then they so, add these, sparkly things to do. A, <laughs> you know whoa it shines it's it kind of fun I mean yeah it's like so we, we were just talking it's like TV I mean you know I was around when TV kind of like when first started not well not really first started but you know when people started to buy them into their homes in the late 1940s the screen size were like this and, and you had yeah. everybody the first person on the block got a TV and so everybody They'd have oh, the, 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 the Red Wings were playing the Rangers, you know, they had a hockey game tonight. And so you'd all run over to the house. They had their chairs all lined up like a little theater, folding chairs, watching a screen 20 feet across the room with little dots. <laughs> <laughs> Gradually, of course, the, the desire, and that's black and white on top of it, and not necessarily great quality on the, on the image. Gradually, screens get bigger, bigger. Col them color enters, oh my God. And then the clarity today of high definition and everything. And now it's back down to tiny little pictures that people are looking at on their phones, watching entire movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? It is. <laughs> it is. We got a lot more people chiming in saying hello, hello. William Call says his eight do eight year old daughter uh, loved your artwork in Alice in Wonderland. Oh, thank so. you. <laughs> that was a, that was a pain. You know, there I, we, Gene said, "Okay, we're doing Alice in Wonderland." Shit, Unicorn Publishing, and we would pick books that were in the public domain that we wanted to do. Of course, we always loved Alice, and and I panicked, man, because it something like four hundred artists have already illustrated Alice, that, up to or down to or over to Silver or Dolly. So, I mean, you have this whole, oh my God, expectation and then Tennille's original drawings and all that stuff. Disney's movie, which many people did not like, but I loved and I still do. Uh, get Mary Blair's production design and everything. And I, I literally had a full blown all out panic attack. And I was literally, and it happened synchronistically i guess on the image that i was painting of alice falling down the rabbit hole <laughs> i just totally freaked out i just i, I don't know what it, it was like you know that whole the panic and i normally i don't feel that way you take on a project it's challenging and there's anxiety which is always there <laughs> but that one had me panic so i stuck a self portrait of myself on the wall as Alice is falling down and I'm pointing <laughs> upwards like, hey kids, you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> anyway, that's just a segue. But in the end, so, yeah. 
it was fun. It was fantastic to do. So when you, when you're painting and you know that it's going into a book, uh, it's going into a card set, and you, how much do you think about the printing process? Uh, I know. Do you still think about it as much as maybe you did in your earlier career? No, 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 no not not really at all. No, I mean the, the, one of the key things because I started in Detroit working in the animation department of an industrial film producer, and you know damn well that when you're painting the backgrounds of which Tim and I painted a lot of backgrounds for, for the films, you you can't have any lumps or bumps. Number one, which was always a key issue for reproduction, you know, in painting. You know, if you slap on paint and it gets thick and high lit and all that kind of stuff and casting shadows, the bumps are, especially in animation, you know, where you've got side lights, you're laying your out flat and the animation camera and you're lighting it from the sides and you're hitting these highlights and bumps. You can't, have, so I was always aware of it really from early on. I like to keep it as flat and smooth as possible for reproduction purposes. If you're painting for live paintings in a gallery, well, hell, do whatever you want. Put the paint on four inches thick. You know, it doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. Now, with like, blues, blues are particularly hard to to get because you, you're starting with a cyan and all your blues have to come from a mix of, you know, a cyan <laughs> and a magenta or and adding yellows or whatever. And, and to get those, so do you... Was that ever anything that like you really thought about or that you consider when you're mixing it? Like, hey, you know, I know that I have to avoid this kind of blue when I paint because it's not going to reproduce. It, it or... isn't so much. It, no, I never thought of that, Keith. It's like if 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 you get, let's say, a hot color and a cold color, blue and, and oranges, the same value. You know, the the their, their values are exact. Sometimes that you get into some, I don't know what the hell, it's like a weird thing happens in the printing. Yeah, if you're rendering from a highlight to the shadow and the colors aren't exactly right, I, I find magenta is a problem too, you know? Reds sometimes and magentas. And I, I remember a lot of being aware of that kind of thing. I think now I don't think about it anymore because I just paint. It probably is totally unconscious, you know? Okay. You've just ad adapted. Yeah. Over the years. I mean, cause I've seen, you know, a good deal of your work and going from, you know, from the painting through the, you know, the high definition scan into the computer with some color correction going on. Uh, but typically not a whole lot, you know? Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen any of your paintings really in production. That, or it's just like, oh my god, this is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> you know that we we have to really adjust this entire color palette because it's just it's going to reproduce as gray or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, one of the advantages that people that work digitally have is that right there in Photoshop or whatever you can set your color palette to be CMYK and it'll limit you to the, that color space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or you could see like, oh, if I pick this color, this color is not going to print well and it's going to shift down to this. And, and so you can adjust on the fly, but that's not something you, you can do when you're painting. Well, the thing too is uh, I, that I, I assume, I mean, art for print is... On paper, here's an old popular science from 1933. There, there it is on paper. Pretty damn good job, for, you know, 1936. Yeah. Uh, it's different than digital because you're dealing with light. You're dealing, everything is much more intense digitally, yep. right? Yep. It, this this gets more, it's just, it, the intensity on paper is, is never there. You can't get that. It's impossible. Is you're not dealing with light; it's an opaque, opaque medium, you know. Okay. So, with that being said, do you do you oversaturate or do you boost the chroma? It depends on the subject. That, that, 
that's only due to the subject. In other words, okay. the chroma thing is like it's not coming necessarily out of reproduction uh, uh, purposes that I'm jamming up chroma or reducing chroma. It's like, what, what do I want this picture to come off looking like? You know? Yeah. So that, I've never, certainly since Gene, in, I've been working with Gene in Unicorn Publishing, and the reproduction that they have these days is, is, is incredible. You know? I mean, there, there were problems, I think, in the past. I remember we were doing stuff with Platt and Monk really old publisher in the Bronx. They did the little engine that could, so they go way back to that. They 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 would they I remember talking with a camera guy and the color uh, guys and they were they were really having problems if we were do, doing watercolor and then doing opaque on top of it, it was like really screwing up their the camera and what the, the camera was seeing. Hmm. So you had to be real careful more careful back then. Now, I don't think there's any, I don't know if there's any yeah. limitations like that, you know, I don't think so. Uh, you know, nothing that couldn't be uh, very quickly adjusted. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember really long conversations with these guys about that kind of stuff, being careful. It's like, I don't think, like now I've taken to a lot, depending on the subject, again, painting on black, on a black canvas. That would have been very difficult back then for the, to reproduce accurately. You know? Yeah. And then yeah, you have, yeah. the, the, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I, I've, I've read it in the past, but I haven't read it lately. Uh, some illustrators would paint, uh, what the hell is his name? God damn it. See, that's, that happens with age. Uh, the, the, the great illustrator who painted right straight out of the tube, oh, as he painted, he did them in color separations. He'd layer each, each layer of of, uh, you know, I forgot what process, but why can't I think? You see, it's a crazy, you know, you know, these names as well as I know you who your you're own name. About. I, I know <laughs> who you're talking about. Just talking, Come on. Uh, Gene, who am I talking about? <laughs> the, the illustrator that, that painted like he was painting color separations. Huh? No, 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 no. The color separator, the guy from the turn of the century. The guy that Michael Jackson loved and had his painting, one of his paintings. Oh, oh, Maxfield Parrish. Maxfield Parrish. Holy crap. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. I mean, jeez, <laughs> oh, man. You know, it's like you, you lose it. He painted, like, direct. That's apparently, that's the intensity that is showing through because it's straight color. He's not toning it with anything. And he's not diluting it in any way, form, or matter. You know, layering okay. the paint on top of each other. Much like like a like an ink process, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure people watching know more about it than I. I know. It. Whatever. Yeah, but guess what? They're they're not talking. <laughs> 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 I feel like a, a goofball. I couldn't even remember Parrish's name. Holy crap! <laughs> it's no worries, man. I I we <laughs> and I was just talking about Maxwell Parrish with Gene, uh, maybe a month ago now. Yeah. So, I mean, he was amazing. It just went right out of my head. It, it looks like he painted separately when you see a lot of his images, you know? It, it, yeah. it, everything is really clear and sharp and, you know, it's really pretty wild looking. That's like the same kind of thing. If I'm not mistaken, I'm never, I've never done it, but like with silk screening and screen printing. Yeah, I, I've never done that they either. To, they have to cut the separations and then... Yeah, and it's just clear color. Way. As soon as you take, yeah. you know, you're mixing, obviously you're mixing a value range. You know, you have to add white to, to these colors to, to get that. You need that. If you're, if this is an opaque medium, you're adding white. As soon as you start to put white into the color, it just, it basically, in a sense, kills the color. Yeah. You know, yep. but you have to do it in order to, I tried once though, when we did Mary Stewart's Merlin, Mary Stewart, Lady Stewart wrote this trilogy. It, it read, it was great. It, it read as the, the reality that preceded the myth. And I remember at that point, I was trying something. Let me see if how many of these pictures I can paint with paint straight out of the tube. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. 
<laughs> but literally, I was using it most colors until finally getting to, a, say, the white center of the sword of Excalibur, you know, the glowing sword in the one scene where yeah. there's white, but right straight next to that now is straight cadmium yellow light, straight cadmium yellow medium, straight cadmium orange, right out of the tube. And then moving into possibly red medium to red oxide to red oxide with all these right, right out of the tube. And some of it worked and some of it didn't. But you, yeah. you can do it all kinds of ways, you know? Yeah, I'm, look, I'm thinking back to those paintings. Uh, <coughs> and they do have a very... Some of the, like I said, not all. Like there's one, he's out in the battlefield and he's, the sword's fl thrown at him or flying or something. And the sky, of course, is a blue sky with white clouds. That needed white paint. But yeah. some of the other ones did not. And I just, you know, and it's... The fire ones, obviously, they work. When you're painting fire, that that's that's no big deal. You know, everything is in this particular scene. It was all monochromatic, so it, yeah. you weren't looking for any skin colors or anything. It just all was totally in the yellows, oranges, reds, and then moving into darkening purple into that as the darkest dark. You know, which this is, dark, which dark. to me reads as black. Yeah, on through my it, repro it reproduces as black. Yeah, but when you see the actual painting live, it has a different impact. So in that sense, I like to use it for that reason because live the picture looks better to me. If you're using black as you move into the shadow color, it it, it, it dulls it out. Dead it dulls it. it. Yeah. yeah, unless you're using it consciously as one of your values and as using black as a color in a sequence yeah. from light to dark or dark to light, you know? Yeah. But it's, you know, with black, just, you know, like straight, like a Mars black, you know? Uh, yeah. There is something about it that it, it's just, it's, it's dull. Yeah, you know, yeah, it is. I mean, I, 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 you can paint with it, though. I mean, I when I when, when we did Dracula, I, I definitely said I'm, I'm using black. I'm going to use black. If then now, okay, now I'm going to work it. I used it. Yeah, I, ha I have to think and assert. Okay, am I going to use black as a cool color in this scene I'm painting, or am I going to use black as a warm color? I have to get it set up in my head that it's actually a color. It's going to be warm or yeah. cool. That is to say, yeah. for the sake of the colors preceding it, you know? And so then, yeah. and, and you, you know, you can, you can do it that way. Yeah. Or I, I did it. I mean, when you, look at, when you look at the Dracula paintings, they, they do have a more muted palette. Yeah. Than, than it's, the other paintings that, that you were done doing, you know, and not just like the Marvel paintings, but right. Oz in particular, you know? Yeah. Um, so the whole thing has a very subdued feel, which yeah. makes it, makes complete sense for the, the subject matter. Yeah, totally. You want it to be more, at least I did back then, I wanted it to be more, you know, black and white, even though obviously color Dracula films have been great, at least. Yeah. One of my favorites still is the original Hammer yeah. Horror of Dracula yeah. with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. That's, I think if I'm going to land on a Dracula movie that I like, that's the one. Because that's the first time you see blood on the screen. I'll never forget. I'm sitting in the movie theater in Detroit, and I was with this kid. We were going to Meinzinger's Art School at the time, and we decided that we wanted to go see it after school. So we walked downtown Detroit, and we sat in the theater, and he was terrified, this kid. He was peeking through his key, through his you know, to his butt on a whole lot of his shirt. <laughs> but you see Christopher Lee standing in that first shot when you cut to him, boom, and that beautiful music. It's almost like, yeah, I don't know, I, it, it, the music is strong in that film. It's a great sound score. And he's got the blood all streaming on his face. Nobody ever did that before. That was never in the movie. You know, they had 
code, the code wouldn't allow blood. You can see a little bit splatter once in a while. You know, bang, bang, you're shot, and it, and it go like this. There's nothing. I mean, you know, guys would fall, yeah. right? Which has always looked very bizarre. Even as a kid, I remember being, wait a minute, you know? There's no, you know, where's the blood? And that was a little like, bit of film trivia that I did not know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that movie, but I did not know that that was the first. That's that's the big time. Then when, when they drive the stake into the heart, you know, with the blood spurting. Oh my God! Uh -huh. People were freaking freaking out in the theater because it had never been done. <laughs> no. Boy, God, can you so, imagine those people coming and seeing movies today? Oy vey! <laughs> yeah, no. John Wick or what? What the hell ever? <laughs> yeah, any kind of horror movie where it's just yeah everywhere. Everywhere. So uh, to get, to go back to uh, art for reproductive um, reproduction, reproductive. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about you know the the color palettes. We talked about uh, you know loosening loosening up your strokes. You know, not noodling in there and thinking about the size and all that. One of the most uh, crucial elements, right, for anything that's going to be a a printed product, right, mm -hmm. is is the visual impact, right? That was that was like the first thing you had said to me is that it's got a readability. It's got to make an impact. Clear. I mean, that's what I grew up with. You know, it's you. I remember being into animation very much so, and reading, you know, great animators at Disney, sort of you know, Ward Kimball and all those guys that you should be able to paint your your animator your animated figure in your drawing, say of whoever it was, Jiminy Cricket. You should paint it all out, be able to paint it all out black and still see it what it registers. It, like silhouette art. To have it really read clearly. To have a tendency to pose like that. Maybe sometimes too obviously. Maybe I should be more obscure. I don't know. But there's a tendency to pose it to make clear what the hell the figure is doing. And that, because, I mean, we talked about this right before, like there's this figure number or time of how much time you have to grab somebody's attention. See, on a book cover in a store, that was always the thing when I was doing a lot of book covers back in the, in the 70s, was the issue. This thing is going to be on the shelf with a whole bunch of other books. What's going to make grab people's attention to that one and not that one and not that one and not there's this mass confusion of all these images clarity and simplicity is the way I, you know what I mean that that powerful punch I think who really had that down was, was Frazetta right the clarity of his composition of his they were very powerful you are almost, yes. almost always that pyramidical triangular thing plus yep. really clear boom you know you have that kind of like that fast impact type thing so yeah, I'm taking that into account, especially when you're doing the small stuff too for cards and everything, you know. Whether or not it succeed, I, most of the time I don't know, but that's always the effort, you know. Well, you know, you you were talking about, you know, maybe your stuff is too obvious that of what you're you're doing. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking. But yeah, yeah, but I, but where I was going with that is, you know what. Whether that's said or not, what can't uh, be said is that it's not readable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, your stuff is definitely is definitely readable. Whether it's on, you know, a, a poster, building, or a card. Yeah. Right. And uh, and you're able to get quite a bit of detail in there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not. It's not just like okay. It's a face and nothing else is going on. Right. Like I mean, you, you, you're you're able that's to always do that. That's about lights and darks also. It's 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 not only the elements within the image and how many there should be or shouldn't be. It's the value range is of light against dark or dark against light, making things read that way. You know. Yeah. That's all part of that, and then color focus. What was it that you 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 said? What was that? You you do a lot of uh, commercial work, and what's the the new thing? The the, the new uh, phrase. Hang on, I gotta I gotta recall it into my head. Is creating a hierarchy, um, 
Oh shoot, man! I just told you this yesterday. It's and like uh, Maxwell Parrish. I remember. I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to go back and look. But a dominance hierarchy based on uh, level of importance. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Right. The, be sure to create a a dominance hierarchy based on level of importance. Bada boom, bada boom, bada boom. Which is mean good composition, strong center of interest, primary center of interest being very clearly stated within the image. Yes. Boom. Or even, what? even more simply put, is keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing. Gene's taping boxes. That's what that sound is. Right. No, that's all right. Well, here, and I said, I, 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 well, you, Keith told me this yesterday about, you know, that phrase that he said, keep the main thing. hierarchy. I, I, and, I, and I had done the sketch from this carving in uh, Rosalind Chapel in Scotland, which is to say, Kings are strong, wine is stronger, women are even stronger, but truth will conquer all. So there's the, the hierarchy of importance from the king to the wine to the woman to the truth, the all-seeing eye. But there it, it, it proceeds upwards and... <laughs> that is definitely the dominance hierarchy. Right. Or in, in the case of the job that I was doing is... Uh, we want the main character to be in a bright yellow jumpsuit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yellow is the color. Well, and in every in every frame that character appears, bright yellow jumpsuit. Yep, that's clearly the one to, the right color to use for that purpose for sure. I remember yep. Haskell Wexler, a great <laughs> filmmaker, back. He did a film called Medium Cool which is about a photographer and his obsession with photography and getting it down. It's, I have not seen that film since I saw it in the theater way back in the day, in the 70s, I guess, maybe. But he mm -hmm. went to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, where it was very much, in 68, very much anticipated that shit was going to happen. <laughs> and he he's telling a story, but his principal, he has his principal actress, actor, woman, wear a yellow dress. Because you're going to put her in the park across from the convention where all the shit may happen. Yeah. And indeed it did with that wild, crazy event with the police attacking, pushing people through windows. Yep. And he could keep his eye on his camera on this woman caught in this melee because of her bright, light, yellow dress. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. It's an interesting film to look at. Like I said, I haven't seen it since then. But it's just, it's about obsession, about art, of photography. He's doing what this guy can't relate to anything unless it's through the camera, you know? It's interesting. I, I've never seen it. It's a really I've interesting movie. It's, it's real and surreal and, and very uh, symbolistic, political as hell. All kinds of stuff, you know? Really unusual. Uh. We have some person asking, and that's actually their username. Uh, he has a question about one of Tim's paintings called like The Fire Pit. It's called The Fire Pit. Are you familiar with that painting? No. Maybe if you saw it, you would be. I probably Maybe. would be. Um, yeah, Tim and I didn't work together for a number of years. And, uh, you know, I tried to keep up with everything he was doing, but I, I can't remember so, it, you know? yeah. What he says is that in in this painting, it just seems like it's pure complementary colors. And how would he plan that painting? Um, that I don't know. So some, yeah, some person. If you can, uh, let me know. If like that was from Tim's TSR days, mm -hmm. or what that was from. And then we could uh, maybe not during this live stream right now, but we could find an image of that and then get back to you on. Right. On, yep. on what what he did there, just so that mm -hmm. you know we're familiar with it. Uh, so to to get back to that visual impact, you know that you're saying, you know, you create the silhouette, and it's the the lights versus the darks, right? Right. And that was one thing that uh, I had been meaning to ask you and to talk to you about uh, for some time now. You know, we always talk about the the lighting. You know, where's the light source, you know, coming yeah. from? You know, what's it hitting? And, and 
And we often talk about, you know, you going using dioxazine purple for your darkest color and, and it reads as black. But I don't think that you know, you and I have ever addressed it in, uh, you know, on the live stream here of that that shadow and those dark colors are as every bit as important as that light. Totally. Right? You don't have one without the other. You can't have light without dark. You can't have dark without light. You can't have up without down or left without <laughs> right or hot without cold. I mean, it's the, it's, the, it's the reality we live in. Subjects are solid. There's a light shining on them. It gets to a dark side. That All those colors in there, as you say, are just as important as all the colors here in the light side, you know? The light or dark... What the hell, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm looking at my screen reversed, you know what I'm saying? So you're, what, what's that color? What's this color? You establish this color that's going this way. What the hell is that? It's a completely different color than this is. Yep. And it's and got a, a good example with what you're showing everybody else right now is is the the black shirt behind it. Which okay. Is really cutting, cutting that arm out, you know? Yeah. So just... Right, it goes through through that whole level of values, and I well, know this, for myself, and I know that I'm not alone in this. Uh, it's you know, young artists, amateur artists, or you know, people like you know, just don't know the, exactly what you're doing. Maybe it's a fear based thing. Kind of always stay in the middle ground of colors, right? Mm. You never get too bright in the highlights, and you never get dark enough in the shadows yeah and it and it ends up creating a mud a visual yeah. mud yeah and well know. it's about conquering fear <laughs> yeah it, and, and it's like either sink or swim kind of like concept right there was that thing out uh, the way people taught their kids to swim was they threw them in the water yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know in this case it isn't quite that disastrous you're not necessarily going to die or drown but you, there's nothing to be lost there's only something to be gained by jumping in and not being afraid of color yeah you know it, there's don't don't fear it tackle it like it's it's exciting and something that can be achieved you can you can learn how to do it you know just don't be afraid of it yeah because what have you got to lose like i say you try it out i mean you're not going to die it didn't work. <laughs> you, you try it again, yep. and, that, and try it yep. again until you until you finally get it. Eventually, you get it if you stick with it. Yep. Like anything, right? Yeah, and it's the knowing when and where to push and pull, right? And right. You know, even in you know in in my last uh, the last paint job I I, I did. You know, not advertising stuff, but the, the paint job. You know, I showed you before I turned it in, and that was like, you're like, okay, you need to make these these brighter. You know, because it's that section's getting too dark in the shadows, right? You know, so you need to make it brighter to read, and you need to do this. And it was like, it just like with a couple extra little brush strokes, it just, you know, yeah. made the image just pop. Yeah. So. You know, it's there. It's all about that. Yeah. The fine tuning. I think, sorry to ramble on about this topic a little bit, but I, I do think it's right. important for, yeah. you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe watching this going, is that there is the tendency to noodle in the middle ground, mm -hmm. you know, and you can do a lot of stuff in there, you know, a lot of, you know, the details and the rich colors and the saturations and all of that. But at the end of the day, those aren't going to make the image pop for that, that right. visual impact. Right. You know. Number one, as I said, first of all, about all of this conversation, we're talking about color and reproduction now. Now we're, a broader conversation about art in general is the, the number one thing is composition. The setup within your picture plane. You know, wh where's the where's the object? Where's the primary center of interest on that picture? Where's your, 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 where is it positioned within the picture plane? You know, picture plane being the shape. 
That's number one. Where do you position that? Then color and value and everything else becomes secondary to that. And then that gets determined by the lighting setup. The color and the value gets determined by the lighting setup. If it's a firelight, you know, you can go strong in, and if it's at nighttime in a firelight, you can get dark with shadows and, and intense with the fire center, the, you know? Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is like, I remember when Tim was working back in the day, he told me that he's talking to some of the early guys doing this TSR stuff that he was starting to get into when we were separated. Yep. They were painting, I don't know which artist it was, but he was painting a scene and the highlights on the armor, the whatever it was, or the dragon, or what the hell ever it was, were brighter than the fire. The fire went up to yellow, or whatever it went up to, and the highlights went up to white on the on the clothes, or whatever, the armor. And Tim informed the gentleman that, you know, gave him an enlightenment. He, apparently, Tim told me he was totally, it became like, you don't, it's like you don't think about the things you don't think about until all of a sudden you, you think about it, or it gets pointed out. Yep. Absolutely. Now, wait a minute. Absolutely. If you have a light source in, in your picture and you can see that light source, well, nothing in the picture can be as bright as that light source or, or else you lose the illusion of lighting that you're after. Yep. And you're after yep. this illusion of lighting. And that's what people have always said about my work is it looks like it's lit up. It yes. looks like it's lit. Yeah, that's because you you think... I. Photography helps that. I did photography for, you know, it's part of my profession. You, 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 you know, you, you learn about exposure. So as you paint a picture, you're exposing too. You know, what's your exposure? In other words, what's your camera lens opened to on your primary center of interest? And as it proceeds downwards from the figure, you know, if, if your light strength is here, you want it all in this area, and then it gets darker as it moves away. You know, so exposure, yep. that's all part of that light against dark and dark against light thing. Is you're kind of like exposing mentally as a camera, you know. So that's that's a whole other thing. All right, I'm going to answer a business question here. Okay. So, uh, to uh, Chris Cohen. He says, hey there, I'm writing a book for games like Dungeons and Dragons, but I need illustrations. How as an artist, uh, how as an artist yourself, do you appreciate being approached for large projects like this? Okay, so I'm going to answer this. Um, Chris, you can approach anyone, right, uh, for a job, right? To contact Greg, you go through Gene. Right, Gene at spiderwebart.com. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can afford Greg Hildebrand. Oh, whoever. Right? <laughs> you can, you can, yeah, you can approach uh, who, whoever you want, but just be upfront with where you are at with your budget. All right. If you don't have a budget, then seek out people that don't want the budget. I don't know who that's going to be. But also, please note that uh, you're asking people to do a job for you. So offering to pay an exposure, probably not the best way to go. So if it's something you want and you want to get published, make sure that you've raised enough money through Kickstarter or whatever uh, to be able to actually pay people something uh, to do the work. But like, with that being said, you can approach whoever you want and just say, hey, I've got this project. This is what I'm looking for. And this is my budget. Can you do it? All right. Does that make sense to you, Greg? Sounds good to me. <laughs> it was clear. Does that yes. sound good to Jean in the background if she heard Jean's that? Still, you hear she's still wrapping the box. She's shipping a uh, painting out. Someone, you know, bought it. She, she wraps, she's. Not only is she a genius at five million other things, but she knows how to make sure that a package is properly, safely packed and wrapped and everything. You know, so that's what yeah. she's doing. Uh, what? Yeah, for sure. A genius gave a, a, a business answer to a, a someone requesting 
you know, a, que a questioning and and uh, he want Keith just wanted to know whether it sounded good to you. I don't think she heard it. Though. She didn't hear it. <laughs> what was the question? What is the answer? So the you have to come over here. I'm coming. Oh, here we are. I can only walk so fast. Do you need to sit? Nope. What was the question? What was the answer? So this will this will be Keith either getting uh, reaffirmed or completely corrected on the live stream. <laughs> there you go, one or the other. Okay. Wow, I don't know what just happened here. I got a million windows just open. Hang on, Keith. Okay. So, so Chris Cohen, um, who replied back that he said he is not paying in exposure dollars, which is good. He said, "How, as an artist, uh, do you appreciate being approached for?" projects and i said uh well he can absolutely approach anyone right uh but like to get a hold of greg he would contact me. right and if he wants to hire someone for a project he should just come with a straightforward thing this is what i i'm doing this is what i'm looking for and here is the budget that i have for this project and as i said he might not be able to afford a greg hildebrandt on a particular project, but he can most certainly ask. And I said, if he has a project that he doesn't have a budget for, he should probably try to raise money for that budget rather than trying to get people to do it for exposure. And you needed me why? <laughs> I just, I said, hey, does that sound good to you, Greg? And then I said, said hey, does that sound good to Eugene? So does that sound good to Eugene? Yeah, it sounds like you've been working with me for too many years. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Hallelujah. You don't need me. I'm going back to my box. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Chris, if you are looking for someone, uh, I see you do, do have a budget. By all means, reach out to Jean, J-E-A-N, at spiderwebart.com. She is a phenomenal business manager and she will either hook you up or point you in the right direction or just say, Hey, I, I'm not able to help with this project. Yep. But for, I think artists in general, you know, uh, probably for the most part, an easygoing bunch, not everybody, but for the most part. So if you come forward straight with a straightforward pitch and proposal, you're going to be fine. Yes, and uh, Genevieve Winters, I, I agree, Jean is way too funny. She makes me laugh every day. <laughs> All right. <Yeah>. That's <laughs> so. Make me laugh. Yep. Well, that's Jessica okay. Rabbit said that to Roger. You know, that's why she's with him, because he made her laugh. He made her laugh. Yep, it's important. Got to have yep. a sense of humor in life, right? Yep. <laughs> Remember so, that scene? Okay, remember that scene? Well, no, go on. No, no, I was no, just no, segueing. No, no, no. I was just segueing into Jessica Rabbit at the uh, Ink and Paint Club when Eddie is sitting there, live action, and yep. she comes on stage and he says, She's married to Roger Rabbit? And Betty Boop <laughs> comes over to Eddie and says, What a lucky Goyle. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite scene in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, more. Okay, so we were where were we at? We were talking about lights and darks um, to help make that visual impact, and probably are. Correct me if I'm wrong in this, uh, but the proper balance of lights and darks are more important to visual impact than a load of details. Absolutely. Detail, right. I mean, unless you have that that strength of uh, light against dark, dark against light, and positioning of the object within the picture plane, objects, adding all the detail in the world is not going to make it a better picture. You know, you can see yeah. that, I think, with a lot, some work, you can tickled and tickled and tickled and tickled, but what wasn't there to start off with was the composition, and and the, the unless you, you you've got to have that strength of composition and 
light and dark. That's number one. Everything else is secondary to that. Colors, uh, detail, all secondary to that. That's not the issue. That's not the main thing, you know? You know, painting, painting every chink, every leaf, or every chain on chain mail is not the issue. When you're painting, say, a knife, well, just go look at some of N.C. Wyatt's King Arthur paintings, you know? The mail is... It's the setup. It's the power of that composition and the way he's dealt with values. That's now everything else now becomes secondary to that. And it's all the rest of it's beautiful. Color, value, you know, and all that. But those yep. issues are there. That's what made him such a strong illustrator, painter, you know? Yeah, the the thing I'm trying to think like with him. The, the the composition was just so solid. Boom. Right? He was That's amazing. like the only word that I can use to describe it. Not like volumetric solid. Yeah. But just bam there. You know. Oh my God. In incredible. He I think he he was always one of my favorites, maybe my favorite really of yep. American illustrators, you know, of that whole era. And yep. and even now, I mean of any era. But the power of his composition. This, but then it's not only the power; it's the sympathy, it's the sensitivity, it's the understanding that he had. You know, it's all kinds of stuff going on. But yes. the strength yep. of the setup was always oh, overwhelming, <laughs> beautiful. It's just incredible. You know, so, you know, with him, and you know, you you had mentioned uh, Frazetta earlier with composition and again very simple yeah right yeah but uh, such a physical impact yeah you know yeah and again a lot of stuff was just very loose and you know with just a couple indication strokes right of what something is and with 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 Rosetta yeah, I mean, there's no two ways about it. He's probably one of the most imitated. Oh yeah, artists out there. The last since the '70s, at least, of oh, those covers that he did, you know, the yeah. Pellucidar and, and, and yeah. John Carter stuff, that became bam. I mean, he had a long career before that, but that's the stuff that puts him in the public's eye. Yes, yes, yep. And, not and, yeah, not a lot of the comic art and stuff like that. No, but, no, but people particularly don't. those Conans and the John Carter Mars yeah. poses and things like that. When I, I find that when people are imitating that stuff, they're misinterpreting what he was doing in some cases, particularly in, uh, you know, he, one of his main like signature things is like, if there's a limb going off into the distance or whatever, it's just scrubbed in, right? You know, scrubbed into the mist or, yeah. or whatever. And, that kind of helps give that illusion of movement. Yeah. You know, but I find a lot of people see that and, and just do it without knowing. Yeah. This, that's the thing. You got to know <laughs> why they don't know why they're doing it. They're just, so that, that's the issue. That, yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Knowing why understanding, you know, as opposed to just copying somebody else. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're copying. It's like, just, I mean, I probably said this phrase, I'm paraphrasing it. Leonardo da Vinci said in, to, to his students, I'm paraphrasing again. You have to take a scientific approach when you're painting. You have to understand and know what you're doing, painting, drawing. You have to understand it. If you're not, all you are is a mirror reflecting something and not understanding what it's reflecting. That's all you're doing. So if you're just slavishly copying without understanding, wait a minute, what's, again, like we said, how is that color moving? You know, yeah. from, from the highlight to the shadow, understanding that, understanding that branch or that, that tree in the distance that it's hazed out and why is it, it you know, so you're, you're basically 
you got to know physics to a degree, either not not as a scientist, but yeah, abstractedly, yeah. right? You, you yeah, can, yeah. have to have a grasp of how things in, are and what they look like and what nature does and how it acts and, you know, yeah. But talking about the Frazetta thing, like you're saying correctly, you know, he's broad painting with with flat brushes, but then like the Death Dealer one, that, that one sitting on the horse, yep. and he gets down to the armor mail, it's very tight. Yep. So he would do that kind of like, that's a great way, you know, there's a lot of illustrators that used to do that, right? Yeah, I still, I would, you in, right? Yeah. I have that tendency. That's the way I kind of think, whether or not I pull it off successfully, but that's in my mind, is that things get less detailed the further away from the center they go. You don't need to have the detail. Why call attention to over here, you know? Why, why yeah. do you want to pull attention to these, to these rocks and, you know, this cliff in the corner? You don't need to keep the focus where it's at, you know, in terms of tightness or detail, you know? I think a lot of people beginning to compose, I noticed that with kids, they have a fear of moving things towards the center. The center, they'll start to draw the bird in the corner or maybe put the moon over here and they're leaving, you know, they're just, they're, they're kind of like a, there's sort of a fear, like the fear of color to bring it towards the main area of the picture. And, you yeah. put you, you like a fist, you know. You put that there, and you leave it there. But that's the way I do it. Once I design a picture, I set the primary center of interest up there. Then I move everything around it. I don't start moving this over in the corner somewhere. I know I already set up within the picture plane where the hell I want it. <laughs> everything else gets moved around that. Yeah. It's again, like you you said it's that fear, and it's almost like you're trying to hide within your own picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, just come out, jump out of the closet, and put it right there. <laughs> right there where you want it to be seen, you know? Here, within yeah. this picture plane. About right there. Yep. About right yeah, there. I, I, I have seen your, you know, your work and, you know, the work of you, the brothers. Of, of where the detail does go border to border, right? Now, but you are able to control that center of interest and you do it with lighting. Yeah, lighting, right, exactly. You do it with stage yeah. lighting, you know, you light Yeah, up. totally. Put spotlights on from the back, yeah. you know, and, and I think- there's stuff going on in the shadows. You know, there's but, detail in those in, in all of those shadows that are there, but yeah, you control everything. Look here. The, this last one I did for, I don't know if you can see it. It's all shiny. But you know, yeah. you do a lot with rim lighting. I love I love backlighting and rim lighting because that, that helps to make things read. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the shine, but it's tough. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You, you can have it very re much register with a lot of nice rim light, which, which, in, a, in an interior like this, you know, you could just do it arbitrarily because that light can be coming from anywhere, you know? Yeah. And if you're outside in a natural setting, it becomes more difficult. You have to get the sun behind your subject and stuff like that, you know, to keep it a natural setup and the natural lighting thing. But interiors are, or exteriors at night in, in artificial light, you can put lights where the hell you want. In fact, that was the fun of doing all the Marvel stuff. You put lights down below so it lights up the character from the bottom, and you can make that any color you want. Depends on the subject and the setup that you're playing with. You know, again, that, that whole color and light thing is dictated by the subject, you know. And that whole the color and light thing that you're talking about, and the way it hits the subject, is also a way to add visual interest into a simplified yeah. composition. Yeah. You know? Like totally. You have to the the, the composition, you know, like I say again, compositions, everything. If you go back and take a look at some of the uh, illustrators, I want to name them all, my God. There's so many of them back in the, say, the 40s and 50s, and principally in women's magazines like Ladies Home Journal and Red Book and, I mean, my God. They, but there were everyday scenes, you know, a couple in the living room having drinks or something, you know, a party. The, the way that they handled structure 
the setup within the it, people should go look at these things, man. The 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 or color. Uh, Edwin Georgi. This guy's freaking yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. They're everyday pretty people, pretty Caucasian people. I mean that's that's what it was back in the magazine days. Yeah. And but my God, what he did with lighting, it's like it, it, it's incredible. The intent he would just you talking about the letter there's a couple laying on a beach, you know what I mean? Bright sunlight from the back, bouncing off the sand, bouncing back. I mean there's more color and light in one of his paintings. Just people who are watching, go check them out. Edwin Georgi, G E I O G I O R G I. And just what he did with color and light. It's, it's phenomenal. Any artist should go check him out, believe me. Absolutely. Yeah. He's probably completely lost to most people. You know? I, yeah, unfortunately, that's the way with the, that whole that golden era of illustration. It's. I mean, they were. So much. Just like guys richness. like Joe Bowler, I mean, and he was be doing these everyday scenes, you know, and they were mm -hmm. fantastic. The compositions, just the way he would use yeah. values, dark against light and light against dark. I mean, ah, mind blowing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is fantastic. And look, man, hey, we are after five o'clock. Oh my God! Look at that. Time flies when you're having the fun. <laughs> it does, man. I always enjoy these conversations. And um, yeah, but did anybody you know. else enjoy it? I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. Just kidding. <laughs> I hope so. We hope so. So, if if anybody watching here enjoyed what we were saying and what we were talking about, by all means, please give us a like and a share. Uh, to view and purchase any originals or prints of Greg's work. Uh, always visit spiderwebart.com. You can see the uh, address down there in the bottom left of your screen. Uh, and as always, we truly appreciate everybody showing up live, uh, chiming into the conversations and, and adding to it. Uh, we, we hope that these conversations enrich your day and drop a little knowledge on you for sure. All right. So, yeah, for sure, I'll tell all you people who are out there who are actually listening, they enrich Greg's day. I'll tell you that. He enjoys it. I want to end with that quote that I love so much, though. King, kings are strong. Wine is stronger. Women even stronger. But truth will conquer all. Oh, God bless us all, everyone. <laughs> As Tiny Tim would say. Good night, everyone. Bye, Keith. Bye. See you next See week. You. See you later, Greg. Bye, Keith.